Good morning, UFLB. It's nice to be with you again this Sunday service. My name is Karen. I hope you were able to join us early and see some of the announcements. There's a lot going on and I know it's, it was just packed with information, but in particular, I wanna draw your attention to all of the fundraisers that are happening right now. Some deadlines are approaching. So if you wanna participate, uh, if you have any questions, I encourage you to check out your e-newsletter or our website. And always you can pick up the phone and call if you have any questions. But it's so important for the health of our fellowship that these fundraisers run well, and we want to support the people who are generously donating their time to organize these fundraisers for us. So with that, it's a beautiful fall morning. I love this time of year when the leaves are changing and the temperatures are changing. It just reminds me of the cycle of life. So how wonderful that we have the message that has been prepared for us this morning. With that, I'll get our slides uh, up on the screen for you. And I wanna encourage you to be sure to um, keep your Zoom controls in speaker view so that you have the best experience for the service. So welcome, welcome to this congregation where for over half a century, we have been seeking to foster community, to grow our spirits, to serve others and to work for justice. We are very glad that you have joined us this morning in our sacred cyberspace. And we hope that here you'll experience love, acceptance and inspiration. After our service, please feel welcome to stick around for fellowship and conversation. Our monthly touchstone themes help to shape our days and guide our journey. And this year's theme is repairing the world. Our October topic is reverence. The idea of reverence for life can be grounded in a theology based on a notion of God or one in which the idea of God is absent. Reverence for life invites us, regardless of our theology, to respond to the question, what in life is holy or precious or sacred for you? The search for answers to this question brings many people to a UU church. We come in search of a deeper meaning. We also come because the answers offered by traditional religion do not respond adequately. We come hoping that a community of seekers will help us with our own religious quest. We are pleased to have Emily Quarles Maurer with us yet again today. As you know, Emily is a child of a UU minister, but has been preaching sermons of her own since 2006. She currently lives in Gilbertsville, Pennsylvania with her husband, her daughter, four cats, and one very outnumbered dog. And I am still waiting to see a picture of that dog. Her message today, as I said, was very much on point for the season, planting hope. Our seventh principle reminds us that reverence for life extends to all living things, even the things with lives very different from our own. New research indicates that the life of a forest is much more vibrant and interactive than we humans may have realized. John Muir said, the clearest way into the universe is through a forest wilderness. Join us as we rediscover the universe through the lives of trees. And now let us enter into worship together. Avi has prepared a beautiful interlude to start with, and he introduces it so beautifully. I'll let him take care of that. Good morning to all of you. A very popular song by Joni Mitchell asks us to imagine a world without trees, or at least a world where they are pretty scarce, and that maybe while we still have trees around, we should learn to appreciate 
the things that we have in our life that we need, that we love, and that we should cherish. Feel free to sing along with me at home or wherever you are today. Don't it always seem to go? You don't know what you got till it's gone. They pay paradise and put up a parking lot. Okay, maybe beautiful wasn't the right adjective, but highly appropriate for sure. So now let's light our chalice to begin the service. Yeah. Read these words along with me. We light our chalice this morning grateful for the love that we experience in this beloved community. May this flame light our way to inner peace, to love for each other and faith in ourselves. Our opening words for the service are by Marjorie Pay Hinckley. True spirituality makes you loving and grateful and forgiving and patient and gentle and long suffering. True spirituality breathes reverence into every act and deed. And now Becca has prepared a message for all ages. Let's listen. Good morning and welcome. My name is Beck Stow and thank you for joining us for our story for all ages today. It is called I Hear You Forest, written by Kaylee George and illustrated by Carmen Mock. The forest has lots to say if you listen. Creak, creak. I hear you trees stretching skyward. Are you trying to tickle clouds? Rustle, rustle. I hear you leaves sharing secrets. So that's where Robin hides her eggs. Croak, croak. I hear you, frog, watching, wide-eyed. Who will blink first? Oops, I did. Trickle, trickle. I hear you stream, singing softly. May I join and sing along? 
Splish, splish. I hear you, dear, drinking deeply. I will tiptoe gently past. Nibble, nibble. I hear you, squirrels, tasting treasures. Is it time to stop and snack? Ooh, ooh. I hear you, breeze, blowing by me. Here's a wish to take with you. Drip, drip. I hear you do drops dancing downward. Do you get dizzy spinning round? Skitter, skitter. I hear you, beetle, balancing bravely. Mama, watch what I can do. Shh, I see you, stone, staying silent. Are you listening just like me? Ooh, ooh. splish, splish, trickle, trickle, skitter, skitter, drip, drip, nibble, nibble, croak, croak, rustle, rustle, creak, creak. I hear you, forest, and all you say. I love you, forest. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Beck. What a beautiful little story that reminds us so much that we affect nature as much as nature affects us. And so now Avi brings us a musical interlude with a song by Tom Chapin, This Pretty Planet. Thank you, Avi. That was so moving. And now it's my pleasure to invite Emily to join us with a reading. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Sorry, I was just telling my children that they needed to hush. <laughs> 
good morning. We call upon the earth, our planet home, with its beautiful depths and soaring heights, its vitality and abundance of life. And together, we ask that it teach us and show us the way. We call upon the mountains, the Cascades and the Olympics, the high green valleys and the meadows filled with wildflowers, the snows that never melt, the summits of intense silence. And we ask that they teach us and show us the way. We call upon the land which grows our food, the nurturing soil, the fertile fields, the abundant gardens and orchards, and we ask that they teach us and show us the way. We call upon the waters that rim the earth, horizon to horizon, that flow in our rivers and streams, that fall upon our gardens and fields, and we ask that they teach us and show us the way. We call upon the forests, the great trees reaching strongly to the sky with earth in their roots and the heaven in their branches, the fir and the pine and the cedar. And we ask them to teach us and show us the way. We call upon the creatures of the fields and the forest and the seas, our brothers and sisters, the wolves and the deer, the eagle and the dove, the great whales and the dolphin, the beautiful orca and the salmon who share our Northwest home. And we ask them to teach us and show us the way. We call upon all those who have lived on this earth, our ancestors and our friends, who dreamed the best for future generations and upon whose lives our lives are built. And with thanksgiving, we call upon them to teach us and show us the way. And lastly, we call upon all that we hold most sacred, the presence and the power of the great spirit of love and truth, which flows through all of the universe, to be with us, to teach us, and to show us the way. That's a Chinook blessing liberty from the um, Western tribes in British Columbia. Thank you, Emily. And, and so appropriate to remind us of the cultures who have found a way to exist and coexist with nature so beautifully. Now's the time for us to share our gifts. And I'd like to remind you of um, our split plate recipient for the month of October. It's the International Refugee Assistance Project, known by the acronym IRAP. Due to the dire plight of the Afghan refugees, IRAP stands, aims to stand up for those people with focus on getting the families back together. While in Afghanistan, the United States relied on life-saving assistance of thousands of Afghans who put themselves in danger to help US troops, diplomats, and contractors. They provided essential linguistic, cultural, and geographic knowledge at their own peril and now they need our help. IRAP supplies systemic advocacy, zealous casework, and strategic litigation. So please give generously. If you're so moved, you can find a link on our website where you can donate online. And as always, you're welcome to mail a check to the UUFLB office. Just be sure to write split plate in the memo line so we can apply your donation appropriately. And again, we thank you for your generosity. And now I'll turn it back over to Emily for her message. Good morning again, everyone. So this morning I'm talking a little bit about um, plants and trees. When I was about 12, I did a research project from school it was about the animal testing industry, the one that made sure that our shampoo and our mascara and things like that were safe to use. It was the 1980s and let's just say I was unhappy with the results of my research. My, un my uncle Roger was a vegetarian, so I knew that there was a way to survive without eating meat. And I told my mom that I wanted to be vegetarian like uncle Roger. 
She said, okay, that's fine, but I'd have to study and read up on nutrition so I'd stay healthy. And I read lots of books like Diet for a Small Planet, the Moosewood Cookbook. And in all my reading, I stumbled upon books about plants that suggested that broccoli had a rudimentary nervous system and that I should be mentally warning my carrots before I cut them up to eat them. Now, I may have been a kid, but I wasn't that gullible. I only mentally prepared my carrots and broccoli for being cut up twice before I decided that if other people couldn't hear my thoughts, then plants probably couldn't either. In my high school environmental club, we put on a play of the Dr. Seuss book, The Lorax, for the elementary school one year. We put on our Dr. Seuss wigs and our cool Lorax t-shirts, and when the guy playing the Lorax declared, I am the Lorax, I speak for the trees, I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues, it never occurred to me that trees were anything other than mute and enduring. They grow where they're planted, and life happens to them, or maybe just around them. In the 2000s, I remember watching the TV show Mythbusters, and when it proved that plants didn't care about human music or understand what English, what people were saying to them when they were growing. They had these grow tapes and they would whisper either wonderful things about how beautiful the plants were or terrible things about how they wished the plants would die. And the plants pretty much ignored those recordings, establishing in my mind yet again that plants are passive. I say all this as background to my introduction to the work of Suzanne Simard. Suzanne Simard is a professor of forest ecology at the University of British Columbia. Her new book, Finding the Mother Tree, Uncovering the Wisdom and Intelligence of the Forest, is part memoir and part overview of her career, researching the interconnected lives of trees. Simard begins the book in much the same way that she begins her 2016 TED Talk, with a memory. Growing up, Simard spent every summer on a houseboat in the Monashee Mountains of British Columbia. Her family were loggers who cut down trees by hand, dragged them out using horses down to the river where they could be floated down to the sawmills. One morning, while she and her brother and sister were still in their pajamas, her uncle Wilfred came running over and they heard their grandfather cursing in French. Uncle Wilfred's beagle jigs had fallen into the outhouse. The dog was too far down and the hole was too narrow to just hoist him back out. So her grandfather, her father, and her two uncles were going to need to dig. So first her grandfather cleared the mushrooms, carefully saving the fruity smelling chanterelles to eat later and noting where the clusters of amaryllis indicated where tree roots would be soft enough to break through. And then they began to dig. They dug through the layers of the forest, from the rotting needles and buds with their brightly colored fungal threads, to the rich dark cocoa hummus layer, to humus layer, to an interwoven basket of gray and brown roots shot through with colorful fungi. They cut through a layer white as sand bleached by the rains, into a layer so full of iron oxide that it looked like the earth was bleeding as they cut through roots as big as a person's forearm, and down past that into a layer strewn with rocks and boulders. Hours more work with crowbars and axes and spades, and the tan earth became gray, and the hole was finally big enough that poor jigs could be hoisted out. This memory was what cemented Simard's interest in the layer cake that makes up the forest ground the roots and the fungi and the rocks and the soil that allow the towering giants of the forest to arch their canopies so far above our heads. When Simard was in college, she had a work study with a logging company. Logging by this time was very different from the logging of her youth. The advent of trucks meant that loggers no longer had to evaluate each tree individually. They could take down whole swaths of the forest all at once, a practice known as clear cutting. Simard talks about the guilt she felt sentencing the giants of the forest, trees who had been alive during events she could only read about in history books, sentencing them to die. But her job was actually replanting. 
Our human belief in the regenerative powers of nature meant that we thought that just pressing rows of seedlings straight into the bare and barren earth would be enough to make them grow. We thought that the even lines that pass for order in the human mind would make for orderly growth and an orderly harvest. Now that I think of it, that quest for order in the forest reminds me a little of the artificial order in the planet under the shadow of it in Madeline Langle's A Wrinkle in Time. So when Simard visited these little trees planted in orderly rows, she found they were all dying. Their needles were yellow. Their little roots stifled in the gray rocky soil. As she left one plot of dying seedlings, she noticed a tree that had germinated naturally that was just about the same age as those tiny little seedlings. But it was doing just fine. Unlike the human planted seedlings that she could pull up easily from the soil, the natural seedling held tight to the earth it was growing in. And just like those tree roots she saw in the outhouse, the healthy seedlings roots were covered with fungi. Those dying seedlings roots, they were bare. Samar did not stay with the lumber company. She instead went into research and her research was aimed at answering the question, why did those seedlings planted by humans in the bare soil do so poorly when the seedlings planted by nature were thriving? The seedlings in the bare soil didn't have any competition at all and that tree that was planted by nature, it had to compete with all sorts of other things, including the fungi all over its roots. Well, what Simard discovered is that that fungus covering those roots of the healthy trees was not just some opportunistic growth or, or parasite or disease, but an essential helper for the trees. Simard discovered that the trees are connected by something called a mycorrhizal network, a network of fungi that connect the trees in the forest to one another, allowing them to share resources like carbon and minerals and water. Simard says plants are obligate mutualists with fungi. She's done a lot of research and right now she has an ongoing study that she calls the Mother Tree Project. It started in 2016 with 24 different patches of forest. It was supposed to be 75. They had to cut it back across nine climate regions in British Columbia. And those forests are logged in different ways from clear cut to selective felling like she did in her youth. The team is tracking forest regeneration. They're tracking the biodiversity and the carbon storage and the productivity. And what they're finding is that the older trees are protecting and nurturing the younger trees through that mycorrhizal network. For example, by offering them water and nutrients on dry days. A single mother tree can be connected to over 40 other trees, including saplings and other mother trees. And the oldest trees are connected the most widely. So my kids, learned about the mycorrhizal network on the Magic School Bus Rides again. In case you were wondering, the episode is Tim and the Talking Trees from 2018. I remember being amazed as I'm watching over their shoulders that trees could have such sophisticated communication. And I also remember thinking maybe the Magic School Bus was exaggerating and making the science a little more fantastic so the kids would like it better. Well, it turns out they were not exaggerating at all. Trees can communicate. They communicate about insects and diseases. They share their water and nutrients. And when they're dying, they send out their resources. They dump their carbon into the root networks so that their families and friends can live on. If you've ever gone walking in the forest and you see a little tiny sapling that's shaded by all the high big trees up above and you wonder, how is it getting enough light to grow in this shady forest? You know, the answer is it might not be. Just like we humans work as a community to support our children until they can support themselves, trees will shuttle nutrient to saplings until they're able to grow big enough to reach the sunlight and provide photosynthesis for themselves. 
And if this sounds like we're hypothesizing a family group structure in trees, well, you're right. There is peer-reviewed scientific research, scientific studies that support evidence that kin recognition occurs in conifers. Samard collaborated with Susan Dudley at McMaster University, which is another Canadian university. And they did this experiment that had three trees growing in a plot together. And although all three trees were the same species, two were related. There was a mother tree and a child tree, and one was a stranger tree. And we, they made sure that the mycorrhizal network was intact in all of these trees. And what they found was that the related trees would exchange more carbon, more nutrients than the unrelated trees. And it's not just Samard's work that shows that trees communicate. For example, a study of acacia trees in Africa showed that when one acacia tree starts releasing bitter tasting tannins into its leaves to ward off a hungry giraffe, all the neighboring trees who are not currently being eaten also start to release the same tannins. Richard Grant's 2018 article in Smithsonian Magazine do trees talk to each other, is an interview with another advocate for the idea that trees can communicate, controversial German forester, Peter Wollobin. In his book, The Hidden Life of Trees, Wollobin anthropomorphizes the trees, kind of to the extent that he is dismissed by other scientists. However, his book is not aimed at scientists. His book is aimed at the average person. He has these really speaking metaphors that help people to care about the forest and help to humanize the trees. And that seems to be Wollobin's real aim. So he manages a forest in Eiffel, Germany. And one of the trees he's famous for pointing out is a beech stump. It's about four or five feet across. It's a big tree. And it was felled four or 500 years ago from what they can tell. If you scratch the stump, it's still green with chlorophyll, despite having no trunk and no leaves to keep it alive. It's being supported by the surrounding trees through the mycorrhizal network. Wollobin likes to say, even the trees don't want to abandon their dead. But I think of it as more of a circle of life familiar to many of us. The young are supported by the old, until the old need to be supported by the young. The Wollobin doesn't just compare trees to people, he also compares trees to elephants. Unlike trees, we find it really easy to empathize with elephants. They have those cute big ears and their babies hold on to their mothers with their trunks, just like we hold hands. Elephants used to have a strong culture with females who would live in matriarchal herds, and males who would either live alone or in bachelor herds. They used to have long migration routes, and they used to visit these graveyards where they would honor their dead, or at least visit them. But we humans interfered with the elephants. And now they're dying out. About 90% of the wild elephants in Africa have been wiped out by humans. At one point, it was considered unscientific to acknowledge that animals feel pain. It was considered unscientific to acknowledge that animals might form relationships. What I just said about the elephants was considered unscientific. Those same people who love their family dog might never be willing to entertain the idea that their dog might love them back. Well, are we on that same precipice with plants? Because plants are so different from us, rooted rather than mobile, hard rather than soft, quiet rather than noisy, we have a tough time feeling empathy for them. We have a tough time acknowledging that they have lives. We can destroy them without feeling too much guilt. We can uproot them to clear land for our houses and then build those same houses out of their bones. The situation for forests is just as dire 
as the situation for the elephants. Trees are disappearing faster than they're growing, in part due to changes in our climate, and in part due to humans taking down trees for our own uses. Simard's finding the mother tree was set in Western Canada, which makes the problem of deforestation seem far away. One of the things that Simard said in her 2016 TED Talk was that Canada actually has more deforestation than Brazil. In a 2021 interview with the Smoky Wire, Simard reminds us that there are only about 3% of the old growth forests left in British Columbia. 3%. Well, that's a Canada problem and a Brazil problem, right? Well, in 2009, a Scientific American article said that we actually do not know how much old growth forest we have in the United States because no one really agrees on what old growth means. However, the National Commission on Science for Sustainable Forestry showed that the Pacific Northwest only has about 6% of its old growth forest left and the Northeast where we live has about 1%. I've read history books that say when Penn's Woods, Pennsylvania means, when Penn's Woods were first settled, a squirrel could travel from the shore of the Delaware River all the way to the headwaters of the Ohio River without ever touching the ground. That is certainly no longer the case. In 2016, a Yale 360 interview with Diane Toomey, Suzanne Simard explained, a forest is a cooperative system. To me, using the language of, this is her as well, to me, using the language of communication made more sense because we were looking at not just resource transfers, but things like defense signaling and kin recognition signaling. We as human beings can relate to this better. And if we can relate to it, we're going to care about it more. And if we care about it more, we are going to do a better job of stewarding our landscapes. Well, the landscape around my house is more of a study of benign neglect. But I'm now left wondering if the trees in my yard are lonely because I'm constantly uprooting or mowing over their seedlings year after year. I kind of wonder if my trees know me and my family, if they can recognize the vibrations of my steps the same way that I recognize the patterns of their branches. I'm not good at keeping houseplants alive, and I've always been able to casually joke about my black thumb. But with this new research, it makes me think about how awful it is to consign a rooted individual to a lonely pot indoors where they can communicate with no one and where the water and the light may be too much or not enough. I think about my commitment to respect the interdependent web of life, of which we are all a part. When did we decide that grass is more beautiful than trees? When did we decide that the mushrooms that appear suddenly in our lawns by the, after the rain were a problem rather than a miracle? Samard says on page 161 of Finding the Mother Tree, roots don't thrive when they grow alone. The trees need one another. We think of nature as the survival of the fittest, but as studies of our own human species prove, cooperation, collaboration, and community always win out over individualism. And when you think about the way that we use the word roots in English, it makes it sound as if we knew this all along. Your roots are where you come from. Your roots are your kin, your family. When you're putting down roots, you're planting yourself in one place, a place where you can grow and form connections and be a part of a community. Our roots connect us to one another 
whether we are the same or different, just like the trees. We need one another to survive. So as I end today, I have a wish for us. May we form communities that are as vibrant and as diverse as a forest. May we cherish and nurture this beautiful planet that we call home. And may we always allow the great spirit of love and compassion to teach us and to show us the way. Amen, salam, shalom, namaste, blessed be, and thanks for listening. Thank you, Emily. What an inspiring message you prepared for us. I certainly learned something, and I don't know that I'll look at trees uh, in the same way and, and to relate it to how we are even in community, not only with our nature around us, but with one another. Thank you so much for that message. And now's the time in our service when we take the time to recognize and lift one another up in love. Let us be fully present and listen with open hearts. If you wish to share a joy or sorrow this morning, I encourage you to click on your Zoom control reactions and then click raise hand to raise your electronic hand and we can help you unmute. Unmute. Uh, Gil and Sherry are there in the background to help me manage that. But if you still need to be old school, gallery view and waving the hand patiently also works. So we'll open up the floor. Would anybody like to share? Well, this is Sherry. I, as long as um, we're kind of waiting for someone else to share. I just wanted to thank uh, many of you that kept me in your thoughts and prayers as I've recovered from my hernia surgery a number of weeks ago. Uh, I am much improved, still working on getting to be 100%, but I really appreciate everybody's thoughts and prayers. Thank you, Sherry. We're glad that you're feeling better. Would anyone else like to share? I think that's it. All right. Well, whether or not you chose to share today, if yours is a joy, we hope that you know that we are celebrating with you. And if yours is a sorrow, we hope you feel our compassion and sympathy. And with that, because I know there are joys and sorrows out there that people may not be speaking of, let's take a moment to pause for a period of silent meditation, gratitude, and prayer. And now Avi will help us to close the service with a closing song that is a traditional hymn, hymn number 21, For the Beauty of the Earth. Perhaps you know some of the words, so I encourage you to sing along. Please join me in the four verses of hymn number 21, For the Beauty of the Earth.
for the mystic harmony linking sense to sound and sight source of all to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise for the wonder of each hour of the day and of the night hill and vale and tree and flower sun and moon and stars of light source of all to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise for the love of human care sister brother parent child for the kinship we all share for all gentle thoughts and mild source of all to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise and now Read these words as we extinguish the chalice to close our service. We extinguish our chalice, but we keep its light in our hearts. May it light our path as we leave this place and guide our way until we are together again. That concludes our service. Let us continue in fellowship.